try to do this. All right, we're going to start with the student overview. And I guess I'll switch to, let's see if I can do that. Okay, the overview. Cold War Simulation. The Cold War Simulation is set in the early 1960s with the destruction of World War II still fresh in the minds of everyone. Cold War leaders were very aware of the potential destruction that a nuclear war would have on the countries involved and their neighbors. Conventional war, war with tanks, planes, guns, etc., seemed to be just as dangerous as escalation could lead to an all-out nuclear exchange if one side felt they were losing. Another aspect of the Cold War was that neither side felt it could show any weakness or fear of taking the conflict to the next level. It was thought that one side or the other would take advantage of any sign of weakness. As the tension escalates, the armed forces will be put on higher alerts. DEFCONs, or defense conditions, will show the level of readiness on either side. Make your moves carefully because in this simulation, going all the way could mean the destruction of the world itself. The World Situation Summary after the unconditional surrender of Germany in World War II, the Allies met at Potsdam, Germany to decide the fate of post-war Europe. Germany had been divided into four occupation zones, British, American, French, and Soviet zones. The capital city of Berlin, deep inside the Soviet zone, was divided in a similar way. The British, French, and Americans were allowed to access over land and through three air corridors, as you can see here on the map. There are two factors that must be taken into consideration when trying to understand why the post-war map of Europe was eventually agreed to by the West, or better stated, allowed to happen. Number one, the Soviets' willingness to suffer catastrophic casualties and their disregard for the sacredness of human life in general. This is mostly attributed to their leader, Joseph Stalin. Two, the West put a premium on human life and they were sick of the death and destruction that had been caused by the war. The evidence of these two theories played out multiple times in, both, in the way both sides conducted the war. Stalin clearly used this to his advantage as the Soviets closed the Iron Curtain on Eastern Europe. The Iron Curtain is a reference to the Soviet Union sealing off Eastern Europe from the West. By 1949, the West had come to the conclusion that all communist countries were the enemy. NATO and Warsaw Pact Alliances The North Atlantic Treaty Organization was signed on April 4, 1949. This alliance is built on the idea of collective defense against a Soviet invasion. The Warsaw Pact was organized in 1955 and was led and dominated by the Soviet Union. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization is not organized in a uniform defense like the Warsaw Pact. In the Warsaw Pact, the Soviets dictate procedures, strategy, and all units are equipped with Soviet military equipment. In other words, all Warsaw Pact forces are led by Soviet leadership and have the same training and equipment. NATO, on the other hand, is a collection of different national forces loosely led by the United States. The Marshall Plan The United States State Department put together a plan to aid countries in Europe who needed help recovering from the Second World War. It was named after the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff for the United States Armed Forces, George C. Marshall. It was also thought that this aid would help prevent future or further spread of communism. 
The United States felt that the lesson of the Treaty of Versailles was to help countries recover instead of punishing them for the war. The West also felt that a strong Western Europe was the best defense against communism. This aid package was offered to the Eastern European countries and the Soviet Union, but it was refused. And there on the map you can see how many billions of dollars um, were given to each country that took the aid, and no one from the Eastern Bloc took that aid. Next thing that we're going to talk about is the defense condition. This is called DEFCONS. This is something that was very um, well known back during the Cold War, which lasted up into the early 90s. Defense Mr. condition... What was that? Uh, Michaela's trying to get on, but her internet is frozen. Okay. Well, she'll be able to watch this when I, get, when I post it. Okay. All right, defense condition, D DEFCON 5. This is the normal state of readiness. No actions taken and the lowest state of readiness of your armed forces. DEFCON 4, above normal readiness. All forces are now on alert and we have increased intelligence and increased security at all bases. DEFCON 3. Heightened readiness. Action. All submarines put to sea. An increase in force readiness and everyone is on high alert. DEFCON 2. War readiness. Long range bombers leave their bases. All forces are now ready to make war. DEFCON 1. All missile silos go hot. This is war readiness, and nuclear war is now imminent. After that, all missiles will be launched, and there will be no way to recall them. Any questions about defense condition? Okay. Now we're going to go over the student orientation and feel free to ask questions if you have any. So this is the Cold War Simulation Student Orientation. Albert Einstein, who is a very famous German physicist uh, who fled Nazi Germany and knew that the Germans were working on an atomic bomb. And this is what he had to say. I know not with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. Albert Einstein is the one who also warned the United States that the Nazis were working on an atomic bomb because we had no program whatsoever. The time frame... Orientation day, which is today, is the first day, and the teacher will explain how the simulation works. The simulation can last between one and two days, depending on what happens. It could also go longer, depending on what happens, since we've never done this online before. The order of turns, uh, the Warsaw Pact goes first. The first thing we have is conventional war, and then we have movement, which like the other simulations, that's when you can move things that you didn't use during war. An all-out nuclear strike. Either side can strike back, and there is 60 seconds to process and hit their targets. So once you, it, one side can um, launch their nuclear weapons, the other side does not have to wait to their turn to launch their nuclear weapons. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. In the order of turns, Warsaw Pact, it goes first, like I said, then NATO, then the independence. Uh, in this simulation, we do not have any independence. Um, and, the only, and Cuba would probably be the only one that um, the teacher will run. The war map symbols. 
Armored divisions are shown with the flags and the little tanks. Missile bases are shown by rockets. Bomber bases are shown by the uh, strategic bombers. Submarines are shown by the little subs that are located on the map. Some strategic vocabulary that was very important during the Cold War. DEFCONs, we've talked about these already. DEFCON describes the alert level or state of readiness for both NATO and Warsaw Pact forces, just to keep things simple. Alliances. After World War II, the world was divided into two alliances, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and the Warsaw Pact. All alliances start the simulation at DEFCON 5. Conventional forces. These are non-nuclear forces. These would be armored vehicles, tanks, planes, ships, things like that. Conventional forces are the forces we think of before and during the Second World War. Armored divisions are represented by tanks. An example of how battles work, uh, if NATO had 500 tanks at a rating of 8, they would have a total of 4,500. The Warsaw Pact had 1,600 tanks, the rating of 8. Their total would be 12,800, and the winner would be the Warsaw Pact. It will be very obvious to begin with that um, the Warsaw Pact has a decisive uh, conventional weapons advantage over NATO. Nuclear submarines. SLBM or sea launch ballistic missiles. Submarines can roam the oceans and are very difficult to detect and allow for very little warning and response time. They carry multiple missiles with multiple warheads. In Defense Condition 2, the bombers leave their bases and reach their fail safe positions. Long-range bombers are so fast they are very difficult to shoot down. Unless they are destroyed on the ground, they are very difficult to stop. So once the bombers are launched, it is very difficult to stop a nuclear attack by them. Ballistic missile bases. These rockets represent ballistic missile bases. Most missiles are located underground in silos. Some missiles are mobile on trucks. DEFCON 1 means that all missiles go hot, and that means they will turn red on the map. That means they are being ready to fire. Warming up in the bullpen, some might say. An ICBM is an intercontinental ballistic missile. Um, these missiles, the fastest missiles known today, uh, travel at around 15,880 miles per hour which means the estimated time from launch to detonation from the Soviet Union to the United States and vice versa is 30 minutes. Missiles are launched from one continent to another and missiles can, may carry multiple warheads to shower a target our system that uh, looks for missiles over the poles. When a missile launch is detected, that's usually how it would be detected by NATO. Nuclear weapons. Tactical nuclear weapons. These are smaller, short-range nuclear weapons used to destroy smaller targets like armored divisions. Artillery, planes, ballistic missiles, these are the ways that those missiles, the tactical weapons can be carried to their target. You must be adjacent or next to the country your targets are in. 
So in our simulation, the range is one country away. And you can destroy the armored units of the other country. All-out nuclear strike. The objective to severely cripple, if not eliminate, an opposing force's ability to make war. Targets are missile bases, industrial centers, population centers, natural resources, uh, military bases, uh, this is a realistic picture of the nuclear detonations as um, strategically guessed by the CIA as to the states that would be impacted by nuclear detonations in an all-out um, Soviet attack on the United States. The procedure for launching a nuclear strike. Now, when we're talking about a nuclear strike, we're not talking about a tactical strike. This would be an all-out nuclear launch of all your missiles. So the first thing the student would say is, I want to initiate snap count. And that puts us in the procedure for launching our missiles. The leader must be verified. The student reads the words in the pink boxes. These boxes, which are covered up, as you can see here, for obvious reasons. Uh, the teacher will give you a line to read, and you will read the words on those two spaces. The teacher will say, I have the code sequence confirmation, and will enter the launch codes into whatever side is launching their missiles and click the launch button. That will trigger a 60 second clock on the map that will give the other side 60 seconds to decide to launch their missiles. And then the same procedure must happen. And so you will hope that you can get your missiles out of the ground before the other side hits you. Launch on warning. Now, this is something that you need to talk with, with your alliances about whether you want to do this or not. Each alliance must authorize this. And the launch on warning means that if another country launches their missiles against yours, you will automatically launch a full strike against them. Now, once you turn this on, you can't turn it off which means if they launch, your missiles will automatically launch. So that's another thing you'll need to decide before tomorrow what you're doing with that. And you can decide that at any time. Um, and you can turn it off if you want, as long as there hasn't been a launch. If it's already on, you can't shut it off because it automatically shuts down all the systems um, that would allow that. Just to have some idea of the effects of a nuclear detonation, this is what it would look like in our community. The orange spot is a fireball radius of 1.5 miles. Now, this means anyone underground or anywhere else has a 1% survival chance in that little orange circle, which would encompass the entire city of Iowa Falls. Now, this is a hydrogen bomb. This is one of the latest nuclear weapons. The blue circle represents an overpressure of 5 pounds per square inch on your body. This would be a radius of 4.4 miles outside of uh, the center of Iowa Falls. Less than a 25% survival rate for people who were underground and all structures would be completely decimated within a 4.4 mile radius. The yellow ring is thermal radiation radius of 19.5 miles. There would be a less than 25% survival rate underground and a less than 1% survival rate within two to four weeks of the blast. All structures would be severely damaged uh, within this radius. The radius outside of that would still 
um, experience damage, but it would be less intense as the ones that we just saw. Nikita Khrushchev, who was leader of the Soviet Union after Stalin, was quoted as saying, the survivors would envy the dead. So surviving a nuclear war probably is worse than just being evaporated. Now, we have very different decision-making processes for the two alliances. NATO's decision-making process is called consensus. And that means, no matter how powerful your country is, everyone has to come to agreement before you do something. So there are going to be some situations that after we finish our orientation today, that you're probably going to want to discuss some situations and what you are comfortable doing ahead of time. Because there may not be a lot of time to make some of those decisions. So that's how NATO makes their uh, or does their decision-making process. Now, the Warsaw Pact is more of a dominant situation. The Soviet Union is very dominant over the Warsaw Pact or the Eastern Bloc countries. Um, Eastern Bloc countries are able to give their input, but in the end, the Soviet Union makes those decisions. So they have a much quicker process, uh, which is um, can be good or bad. So, uh, in an ordinary classroom si uh, situation, you would be doing a journal and report. Um, you would have to research to find the answers. If you're doing this for credit, we're doing this as an example, as part of our um, quarantine work. So, you do not have to do the report. Journals, of course, uh, are as well. Since this is not for credit, um, we don't have to do a journal, uh, but we'll hope that you'll think about a lot of these things as some of you are not going to get this in class. So, And that's it. Looks like I lost my class. Well, I guess I got to go back and find it. Well, they still had like, uh, when it was there. When did you lose me? Uh, during the ICBN ago. thing. We wondered if you were like presenting the rest of the thing and didn't know you were off. That's exactly what I was doing. <laughs> I took the thing. I took the thing off, and then when I went back, there was nothing. <laughs> like, how long have I been talking to myself? Um, this is all right. Let me let's okay. Let me go back to we were at ICBM. Yeah. Jeepers. Um, tell me where we're. Are we past this? On this, on the orientation video you sent out, I think we're at like five thirty-one. Right here. We can't see your screen yet. Oh, okay. Uh, let me get change that. All right, got it now. Yep. Yes. All right. Does this look right? Yep. So, mm -hmm. just want me to start right there? Sure. Take two. All right, so ICBMs or intercontinental ballistic missiles. Hang on a second. I don't want to look at that the whole time. So an intercontinental ballistic missile is really what it says. It travels from one continent to another. The estimated time from a launch to detonation, whether from the Soviet Union to the United States or the United States to the Soviet Union, is approximately 30 minutes. Now, 
Missiles can travel at approximately, the fastest missiles that we know of today uh, are uh, about 15,580 miles per hour. Um, so that's how long it takes to go from one side of the world to another. Missiles are launched from one continent to another. Missiles may carry multiple warheads to shower a target with multiple detonations. So imagine a rocket, and on top of that rocket in the cone is like three or four, or maybe even six nuclear warheads. So one rocket could bring a lot more destruction than just one nuclear warhead, uh, which is a scary thing. The dew line. So for NATO, this is an early warning system across Alaska and Canada that is an early warning radar. And this will pick up a missile launch from the other side of the world. So when missiles are coming over the North Pole, this would give us an early warning system uh, for the United States and Canada. All right, so let's talk about nuclear weapons. Tactical nuclear weapons. These are the smallest of nuclear weapons. These are smaller, short-range nuclear weapons used to destroy smaller targets like armored divisions. Uh, they can be carried by artillery, planes, or ballistic missiles. You must, in our simulation, you must be adjacent or next to the country your targets are in. So in other words, the range for these are only one country away. An all-out nuclear strike. The objective here is to severely cripple, if not eliminate, an opposing force's ability to make war. Targets are missile bases, industrial centers, population centers, natural resources, military bases. This is a map that was put together, um, I think, by the CIA. I don't remember. It was a long time ago that I researched this. But these are the, the targets the Soviet Union had on the United States in an all-out nuclear strike. So you can look at your state and see uh, what it would have looked like. The procedure for launching a nuclear strike. Now we're not talking about tactical nuclear weapons and using those. This is if you are going to launch all your missiles. The student would say... We want to initiate snap count. Now this puts us into the procedure to launch all your missiles. The leader must be verified. The student reads the words in the pink boxes. Now I've obviously covered them up here because we wouldn't want to let out all the top secret launch codes of the NATO forces. So the teacher will say, I want you to read line one. And then you would read those two words, and this would confirm the codes and start the launch sequence. The teacher would then say, I have code sequence confirmation. The codes would be put into the launch system, and the launch button would be clicked. And that means you now have 60 seconds until your missiles are going to be launched and start to hit their targets on either, for either side. So obviously, if you have 60 seconds before the launch, that means the other side has 60 seconds to decide to launch theirs. If they can't make that decision in 60 seconds, then um, they could get caught with their missiles on the ground, and that means they would not be able to launch their missiles. So this is kind of one of those situations where after our orientation today, uh, you're going to need to talk amongst yourselves about what kind of decisions you would make in certain situations because you may not have enough time to have a full-blown discussion. This is one of the reasons that the War Powers Act was initiated for the executive branch for the president because they did not believe there was time for Congress to debate whether or not we should launch our missiles when in 30 minutes those missiles would be landing all over our country. And that's a big controversy now because the War Powers Act gave the president a lot more power to make war than previously any other 
um, presidents had during the Cold War. So um, this is kind of a, a something that is that the founding fathers could not have imagined this situation. So that's kind of something that um, the government has to figure out. Launch on warning. Now, this is something you really have to decide. Another thing you're going to need to talk about. Um, each side must authorize this. If another country launches their missiles against yours, you will automatically, automatically launch a full strike against them. So this means if you turn on launch on warning, if they launch, you automatically launch. And you cannot stop it. Um, you can turn this off and on as you want, but once there is a launch and it was already on, your missiles are going to be automatically launched. Okay, That could be a deterrent. That could also be a scary situation as well. So you're going to have to decide whether you want to do that or not. I thought it would be important to kind of understand the effects of a nuclear detonation. We'll use Iowa Falls, Iowa as our center of our nuclear detonation. The orange dot represents a fireball radius of about 1.5 miles, which would pretty much encompass the whole city. There would be a less than 1% survival rate of people who were underground. If you were not underground, there have no chance of survival. The blue circle represents an overpressure of five pounds per square inch on your body. Uh, this would go out as far as a radius of 4.4 miles and begin to diminish after that. Uh, there would be a less than 25% survival rate if you were underground and all structures are completely decimated in that area. The yellow ring represents thermal radiation radius which would be uh, the farther you get out, the more it would deteriorate, but you're talking 19.5 miles from the epicenter. There would be a less than 25% survival rate initially, and that means right away the radiation would be so hot that it would kill you. Uh, less than 1% of the people who are uh, exposed to that radiation would survive in two to four weeks and all structures would be severely damaged in that radius. Um, Nikita Khrushchev, who was the premier of the Soviet Union during the Cold War, one of his famous quotes was, the survivors would envy the dead. And I think what he means by that is, surviving a nuclear war would not be ideal. You would probably be better off to have been vaporized and never have felt anything, because the world afterwards is going to be a very dark and cruel place, to quote uh, Maximus in The Gladiator. So, decision-making processes. NATO and the Warsaw Pact have very different decision-making processes. Uh, in NATO, regardless of the size of your power or whether you have nuclear weapons or not, um, everyone has to come to agreement. You have to come to a consensus. That's their decision-making process. The Warsaw Pact is a more dominant process. And so if you're one of the Warsaw Pact countries, uh, you are to give your advice to the Soviet Union, and um, they will take it into consideration, but they have the final say in this. Um, so that's the decision-making processes for both alliances. Uh, we're not doing the report because this is not required. Uh, if we were in class, we would definitely be doing the report. Uh, this would be something you would do during class, in downtime, or outside of class. Um, your journal as well. Um, some of the th questions, you're going to have to do research to find the answers. Journals, of course, for every day. Um, I would do it after class every day. Again, since we're in... Um, we're kind of locked out of school right now. We're, you're not going to have to do that because this is not for credit. All right.
and that is it. So, do we have any questions? I hear rustling around, so we must still be live. <laughs> No questions? I'm okay. good. I'm good. All right. Sweet. So we will meet again tomorrow at 10 o'clock. We will start with the Warsaw Pact. Uh, I have, uh, I will be sending the Soviet Union an email with special instructions. Um, and what you can do, what I would do is I would, uh, you know, do some kind of a chat or, or Zoom or something as a group now on your own um, before tomorrow so that you are ready to go because this one goes kind of fast and it gets pretty intense pretty quick. Um, so I would discuss and do go through all the questions each one of you has for your alliance and be ready to go. Sound good? Yep. 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 All right, well, we will see everyone tomorrow then. All right. Bye. All right, so...